Well, let me invite you to take your Bible and open to the book of Genesis as we pick up where we left off two weeks ago, uh, as we uh, are continuing and, and towards the end and wrapping up our series uh, of heroes. And uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the introduction or introductory portion of uh, the narrative about Joseph, and uh, we frustratingly got him as far as the dungeon, and we left him there. And uh, you might have been thinking for two weeks now, we've been waiting to get this fellow out of the dungeon, but comparatively to the narrative, two weeks was a very brief period of time. Uh, but this morning, as uh, the Lord allows us, we're going to engage uh, portions of the rest of this narrative. And let me uh, invite you and encourage you that if you weren't here two weeks ago, uh, just to go back and maybe check out that uh, online and, and sort of see where we covered uh, the introduction to this idea of a suffering hero. And because in this series, we've looked at people that did, by faith, great or mighty things for God and engaged in wonderful things for him. But the narrative of Joseph is a little different from the rest of the ones that we've examined because up to this point and largely through uh, the, the, the lion's portion of the text, uh, Joseph just seems to catch a, a couple of bad breaks. But if we read this text through the lens of God's sovereignty takes on a vastly different picture, that vastly different image. And so if you're not familiar with the narrative or if you're new to Bible study, I would encourage you to go back uh, several chapters, sort of through the mid-twenties of Genesis and read up through uh, where we are today and then on into the rest of the narrative so that you can get the full flow of what's uh, been happening. But we'll revisit that a little bit this morning as we uh, do a bit of review, but then come back to what we're talking about to pick up in the narrative. But I want to invite you to look in Genesis specifically, chapter 41, uh, because at the end of chapter 40 is where we last left Joseph. And we ended with this phrase that in the end of chapter 40, in verse 23, says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And this is where we last left our hero. Joseph had been abused by his brothers he had been accused by Potiphar's wife, and he had been abandoned by all of them. He had been abandoned by his brothers to slavery. He had been abandoned by Potiphar to prison, and uh, he had been abandoned now by the chief cupbearer by forgetting him. And if you remember the narrative, uh, Joseph ends up in prison, and he interprets dreams for a baker and a cupbearer that have similar dreams, but he gives them vastly different interpretations. And for the cupbearer, his uh, the, the plan God has for him, his dream was that he would be restored to his position. And Joseph asked him halfway through chapter 40, when you're restored to your place, will you remember me and get me out of this place? And three days later, there's a feast that's given and the cupbearer is restored where we come to the phrase, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And as we move into chapter 41, we begin with this phrase. Now, it happened at the end of two full years. Press pause. I realize that's in the middle of a sentence. But I want us to catch the timetable. Two years passed between chapter 40 and 41. What I said two weeks ago still rings true that as we look at suffering and we strive to have a biblical understanding of suffering, what I cannot promise you is that if you are in a season of trial and difficulty and suffering right now, what I can't promise you is that God will bring a, a swift or efficient end to this season for you. I can't promise that, not on the standard of scripture and but what I can promise you is God's faithfulness in and through this season of suffering and trial because we looked at that reality a couple of weeks ago that we need to have a biblical understanding of suffering because it is in the midst of trial that our heart and our emotions often scream the loudest to strive to lead and to do the things that they were never created to do. 
When we're in the, a season of trial and difficulty, we are very often most tempted to let our emotions lead us in which the, the, our emotions will often and most always look for the path of least resistance to get out of the season of suffering. And if we view our per perception of God through the lens of our emotions when we're engaged in trial and suffering, we may be tempted to think that God isn't actually good or that if he's good, he's not sovereign. And if he's not sovereign, uh, then he can't be. This, this whole mixed wrong thought about who God is through the grid of our suffering and our trial instead of looking at who God is and interpreting our trial and suffering through the truth of who God is according to Scripture. Because very often we have the idea that if we're enduring some sort of hardship, we go to one end of, 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 the, of the spectrum. We think either I'm suffering, therefore God isn't good, because how can a good God allow difficult things to come to me? Or we go to the other end of the spectrum that says I must have done something wrong, therefore God is punishing me. Suffering is not always punitive in nature. So for us to have an understanding of suffering, we need to look at people through the Scripture like Joseph and like Job who suffered well and learned from them. But two years pass. Two years pass where he wakes up every day still in prison. Have you ever had those days or those mornings where you woke up and for just a moment you, you didn't know where you were? Is that just me? Last Sunday morning, as I was preparing to, to preach this message three times at the other campuses, last Sunday morning that happened to me. I woke up and for about 45 seconds... I was relatively certain where I was, but I had no concept of what day it was. And, and as I woke up in that, that, that stage, or that, that status between uh, post-alarm and pre-coffee, I, I knew I was at my house, and for a moment I thought it was Tuesday, and I thought, why am I waking up so early on a Tuesday? And so I looked at my alarm, uh, which is on my phone, and, and as I was, again, post-alarm, pre-coffee, trying to find any button that will make it stop, I looked and it said Sunday, and I thought, wait a minute, that should be important to me. <laughs> In my line of work, getting up on time on a Sunday is good. And so in, in this rush of reality, it's Sunday, alarm off, get coffee, you've got places to be. I thought that, that, that moment of not knowing, I thought, I wonder if Joseph ever experienced that in these two years. If he woke up in that early morning haze and thought for a moment that he was back at home and not in prison and that the tattered dirty blanket that he may have had was actually the coat that his father gave him. And as he came around to that reality and rubbed the sleep from his eyes, he looked and thought, nope, still prison. Two years pass from one chapter to the next. And his last request was, will you please remember me and give a good word to Pharaoh and get me out of this place? This is not a place of ease or enjoyment. He's longing to not be there, but yet from the text, we only hear him give glory to God and only hear him point people to the power of God and what God can do. And we're going to see that again in chapter 41. But I want us to, to, to let ourselves sort of just steep in the reality that Joseph's experiencing. 
to not think that he was somehow supernaturally removed from the reality of his surrounding because it seems like with every turn of this narrative, things go from bad to a little bit worse because he gives a bad report about his brothers and it makes them angry. And so when they have opportunity, they decide out of the kindness of their heart not to kill him, but they sell him. And so he goes into slavery and he goes from slavery to, to, to prison and he goes from prison to being forgotten. And here we have him today. And two years pass. And Pharaoh has a dream. Go back to the text. And behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. And then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. And then Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. And then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the, the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And now it came about in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And so he sent and he called for all the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret the dreams or interpret them to Pharaoh. And, and it's interesting what happens in verse 9. So Pharaoh's had these dreams. He gives them uh, to the people that ought to be able to tell him, and they tell him nothing. And so we come to chapter 41, verse 9. And then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh because he's observing all of this stuff going on. Because in his normal uh, routine of the day, is his area of service, he would be bringing things to Pharaoh uh, to serve him and to put before him. And he hears that he's troubled and he sees the conversation going on. And, and it's almost like he sort of sidles in to Pharaoh and says, it's, this is the, the southwestern Virginia vernacular about this. I sort of hate to bring this up because it might remind you of what you did two years ago. But I feel compelled that I should tell you this. This is what begins to unfold in verse 9 where he remembers finally Joseph. And then the chief cupbearer spoke to, Joseph, spoke to Pharaoh and said, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants and he put me in the confinement of the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief cupbaker, or excuse me, the chief baker. And we had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. And now a Hebrew youth was there with us, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came about just as he interpreted for us, so it happened, he restored me to my office, but he hanged him. And the Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, in verse 15, Pharaoh kicks the door open for Joseph to move into a grand expression of self-promotion that will most certainly move him from one place where he's miserable to a place that he's at least tolerable. Because the last thing we heard from him was, can you get me out of here? But he's been forgotten. But true to the character of Joseph that's been on display through the entirety of this narrative. Look what he says in verse 16. And Joseph answered to Pharaoh saying, it's not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Yet again, more evidence that Joseph continues to, to direct people and, and push people and move people towards the power of God. I can't do it. God will give you the answer. And so Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, In my dream, behold, I was standing by the bank of the Nile. Behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. And lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I have never seen for ugliness in the land of Egypt. And the lean, cow, and lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows, and when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. And then I awoke, and I saw also in my dream, and behold, seven ears, full and good, came up on a single stalk, and lo, seven ears, withered and thin, scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. 
And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ears. And then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now Joseph said to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. I want you to underline that phrase or mark it or take a note of it or something because this is a bold statement. Because Joseph tells Pharaoh, who in Egypt is perceived as who? God. Joseph says, God has told you what he is going to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. And the dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. The seven thin ears scorched by the east wind shall be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Twice in four verses he says it. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine. It will be very severe. And look at verse 32. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. Three times in his response, he says, God has told you what he's going to do, and there's nothing you can do about it. It has been determined by God. This is what he is going to do. And if Joseph had stopped talking right there, he would have given an accurate interpretation, as God told him, of the dream. But he continues to speak. And now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce in the land of Egypt in seven years of abundance. And let them, all gather, let them gather all the food in these good years that are coming and store up the grain for the food uh, in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. And let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in Egypt and so that the land will not perish during the famine. As I can tell from the text, none of that part was part of the dream. Pharaoh asked Joseph, what does the dream mean? And he told him what the two dreams meant. And because he heard it twice, God has determined it. This is what he's going to do. There's nothing you can do about it. And then he, but then he brings this brilliant plan to the table and says, this is what I would do. Prepare during the years of famine, for, or for the years of good, for the years of famine, and set uh, people to watch over it so that, that the land can survive during the famine because it's going to be severe. It's going to be so severe that people won't even remember how good it was. And it seemed pleasing to Pharaoh. It's an interesting bit of insight that he has that doesn't appear to come from the dream. I do believe it comes from God, but I don't believe it comes from the dream. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all of his servants, and the Pharaoh said to, servant, uh, to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom there is a divine spirit? And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you are. So you shall be over my house. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all of the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold necklace around his neck. And he had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee! And he set him over all the land of Egypt. And moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. Press pause after verse 44. Holy smokes! Joseph wakes up in prison and goes to bed second in charge of Egypt. Like that. After a long process of suffering in misery, abandonment, accusation, and just that quickly, God moves him from one place to the next. I know you're probably concerned right now because we're this far into the process this morning and you've got four things that don't even have blanks on them. We're going to pull from this text and, and the previous ones and the ones we're going to look at ahead four principles about God's sovereignty and our suffering. 
And I say they're principles because I believe they're present all throughout the Scripture, not just in Joseph's life. But they're on grand display here, but I believe we can see them applied throughout the context of Scripture. And the first thing I want us to see here is that God's sovereign hand is over our, so over our suffering, and God is purposeful in his sovereignty. God's sovereign hand is over our suffering, and God is purposeful in his sovereignty. That is a hard truth and principle for us to wrap our hearts around. We might mentally understand it, but to embrace it is really difficult for us. Because when we're in the midst of trial and difficulty and suffering, it hurts. And we might be crying out to God saying, why don't you move me from this place? This is uncomfortable. This is painful. How could this possibly be under your sovereign hand? That's why we've got to let the scripture tell us who God is, not let our emotions try to figure him out. But all through this process, we see God's sovereign hand moving in Joseph's life. Through the events of chapter 37 through 40, we saw how God sovereignly worked in the events of Joseph's life to accomplish his purpose. Let's go back and look at some of those phrases that remind us. Go back and look in Genesis chapter 39. In chapter 39 is where uh, Joseph is accused by Potiphar's wife. But I want us to see these phrases that remind us of God's sovereignty through this whole process. In the first part of chapter 39, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him, or bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken them down there. And in verse 2 it says, And the Lord was what? With Joseph. You know, but, but isn't he a slave at this point? Yes. Hasn't he just been sold into slavery by his brothers who abandoned him? Yes. But the Lord was with Joseph. And so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Look in, in verse 3. Now his master, who is Potiphar, who is not a God follower, saw his master saw that the Lord was with him. So the Lord is with him, even in such a way that the people who don't follow God recognize God's presence in his life. The Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And so even in less than ideal or pleasant or easy circumstances, God is with him and causes him to prosper. What he doesn't is remove him from his circumstances. But the Lord was with him. Look at the end of chapter 39, verse 21. The accusation has come. He's been put into prison. Verse 20, so Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he, there, he was there in the jail. Verse 21, but the Lord was what? The Lord was what? With Joseph. But, but, but Brian, his condition has just went from bad to worse. Yes, but God never left him. God never abandoned him. The Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. I, I want us to be comfortable with the emotive conflict there. That the Lord was with him, showed him kindness, caused what he did to have favor, but did not remove him from his circumstances. That ought to rest oddly on our hearts and minds if we look at it from a Western perspective that says God's blessing is always attributed to ease. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for Catch the weight of verse 23. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because what? The Lord was... With him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. So he comes into Potiphar's house. Potiphar gives him charge of the house because the Lord's made him to prosper, but then accuses him, sends him to jail. The same thing happens. The Lord is with him. The Lord causes all the things that he does to prosper. And the jailer, who has a lot of responsibility, if Joseph's over it, doesn't even think about it because the Lord causes it to prosper because the Lord is with him. So we continue through the narrative, we see this same 
principle over and over, but the Lord was with him. We go back to chapter 41. Joseph interprets the dreams because the Lord is with him. He gives God credit for it, gives God glory for it. He points the, the, the wisdom and the interpretation to God, that God gives it because the Lord is with him. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. But God is with him. And at the end of chapter 41, we, or the, the middle part of chapter 41, we have a reference to the timetable. Verse 46, now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and throughout all the land of Egypt. God is with him, causes what he does to prosper. And so we see through the events of this narrative that God is sovereignly over and involved in his suffering, and God is purposeful in his sovereignty. God is not working by happenstance. God is working very purposefully in the life of Joseph. The second thing that we can see from this text is that God positions his people for his purposes. God positions his people for his purposes. While God was purposeful in his actions and plans, the primary character, Joseph, who he desired to use in this process, lived in Canaan. God had to move Joseph from Canaan to Egypt. But not just move him geographically, but move him positionally. Because God could have supernaturally picked him up from Canaan and dropped him in Egypt, and he would have still been in Egypt, but nobody but God works sovereignly through these circumstances to position him, to put him in front of Pharaoh with this idea. And so God sovereignly moves and positions his people for his purposes. And I want us to, to jump ahead in the narrative. And for the folks that are narratively minded, that, that enjoy all the details of the story, this part's going to really frustrate you because we're jumping through some really incredible stuff. Because the famine makes it all the way to Cana and and... Joseph's father recognizes that Egypt has food, and so he sends his sons to Egypt to buy food. And, and Joseph has this wonderful engagement with them because when they come in, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him because it's been a while since they've seen him. And by this part, he probably looks more Egyptian than he does little brother. And they come and they speak to the second in charge of all of Egypt, and then Joseph kind of messes with them a bit. Sends him back home, ask about another brother, ask about family, puts money back in the bag. Wonderful part of the narrative that you really should go back and read. But when we come to chapter 45, this part of the engagement is, is coming to a conclusion. And it says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried and, and said, have everyone go out for me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now, this is, this is a, I'm so thankful that God preserved this for us uh, because this is when Joseph's going to reveal himself to the ones who betrayed him. The one who Pharaoh has said, no one will raise their hand or foot in Egypt that you don't say so. He literally will hold their lives in his hand. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. But this Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. I wonder how they felt in that moment. Sometimes when, I, when I'm afraid, I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach that's not pleasant. I'm Joseph. Is so my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. But this is the understatement of the text. For they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. At this point, they don't know if come closer means come closer so I can see your face when they take your head. Or come closer to me so I can look at every one of you and tell you how you're going to die. All he says is come closer, and they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. 
For God sent me before you to preserve life. Catch the weight of that. God sent me here before you. Yeah, you might have sold me, but God sent me. Joseph's looking at the larger picture of what God has done here, which is wonderfully consistent with what he has done through the entirety of the text. Now, do not be grieved with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor, plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. It was not you who sent me here, but God. God positions his people for his purposes. And that positioning may not always be pleasant, but it is always purposeful. That positioning may not always be pleasant, but it's purposeful. And it's not only purposeful to put Joseph into that position, but we also see how the third principle that we can draw from this text plays in this narrative. The third thing that we can see is that God, God can sovereignly use suffering to train us for future plans. God can sovereignly use suffering to train us for future plans. And the reason I termed it that way, that God can use suffering for this way, because there are times that God brings suffering to us in a way to move us away from sinful behavior. There, is, there are times when God brings or allows suffering to come to us to, to discipline us and to correct us, but that is not the case here. That's not always the, the reality of suffering. There are times when God is using suffering to move us, but also to train us. Look in Genesis 41, verse 40. So Joseph has interpreted the dream. He's given the plan. Pharaoh says, you're the guy. You shall be over my house. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne, I will be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. All the land of Egypt. Pharaoh makes Joseph over all the land of Egypt. After knowing what the next 14 years are going to look like. And giving of this great plan, I've used these seven years well, and because the seven years after are going to be horrific. He says, good, go do that. And aside from me, you're in charge. Nobody raises a hand or raises a foot in all of the land that you don't say so. You ride in my second chariot, and people will bow down when you come through. What is his job description up until the point where he is sold into slavery. If we go back and look at the narrative, there are two things that we see that he does. First of all, he is a, he is, I'll call him a pseudo shepherd because he's daddy's favorite. He works in the field some, but what we have mostly is that he's there really just to give a report. And when he comes back, he gives, so his job description up to this point is pseudo shepherd and tattletale. And God not only moves him physically to Egypt and positionally from uh, an unknown to second in the land, but he has also used these trials and difficulties to train him for what's coming. Because as we look through the process, he give, is given increasing responsibility through the whole narrative. When he gets thrown into the pit, he's a shepherd and a tattletale. Then he's sold into slavery, and the Lord is with him, and the Lord causes all that he does to prosper. And so Potiphar's house increases in wealth. And then he's thrown into prison, so contextually bad to worse, positionally more responsibility. And we're reminded again, what? And the Lord was with him and caused all that he did to prosper. 
And he stays there and does that for a couple more years until God moves him positionally to second in the land. And when he gets there, he knows exactly what to do because he's been increasingly in being given responsibility as the Lord has been with him and the Lord has prepared him. And the Lord has caused favor to come to him. So God didn't just positionally move him from one place to immediately, but he, he, he seasoned him through trial and suffering. There are things that we learn in difficulty, in seasons of trial and suffering, that where when it's easy, God may not have our full attention. I told you about when I burnt my finger on the car cigarette lighter. That was dumb. But I pushed the button in and it popped out. Some of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. You push it in there and you pop it out. And it's got these little rings inside and it doesn't look hot, but it was hot. So, you know, I just burnt the tippy point of my index finger. But as soon as I touched that metal, every cell in my body was acutely aware of what was going on at the end of my index finger. Suffering tends to get our attention. When we're in trial and we're in difficulty, very often God has our full attention. It might be through our cries, it might be through our screams, it might be through our anguish, but it is certainly with our attention, or as followers of Christ, it should be. God can sovereignly use suffering to train us for future plans. James chapter 1 talks about that as well, that we should in consider joy when we encounter various trials, knowing that God is using these things to perfect our faith. And the fourth thing that I want us to see, we're going to have to turn to chapter 50 for this. So go ahead and look in chapter 50. God is sovereignly working for our good. God is sovereignly looking and working for our good. Genesis chapter 50, Joseph's coming to the end of his life. Now you should go back and read the verses in between, the chapters in between, but... In verse 18, it says, Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. With purpose, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You meant it for evil. Your actions were evil. He doesn't say, you're, really, you, you were misguided, but you really had good intent. No, your actions were evil. But they weren't outside of the sovereignty of God. Because what you meant for evil, God meant for good. To preserve many. And I love how this phrasing comes. So therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And it says, so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. If you remember at the beginning of this narrative, when we first were introduced to Joseph and he relayed the dreams to his brothers, it says they hated him and that they hated him even more. And it said, and they could not even speak a kind word to him. I think this is a beautiful bookend for this text that at the end of his life, he recognizes your actions were evil, but God meant them for good. That even there, he is able to speak kindly to them because he sees God's sovereign hand at work and that at the end of this process, all of these things, even as difficult and as uncomfortable as they have been, are all working 
for God's glory, for God's purposes, or God's good. But what I don't want us to do this morning is to simply look for the end result. Because right now, if you are in a season of trial and suffering, I want you to be encouraged by the phrasing that was consistent all through Joseph's life, as is consistent in Scripture, as is consistent in our life, that the Lord is with us. Because what I can't promise you is a quick end to your suffering. If you can just hold on for a little while longer, if you can just have enough emotional energy to hold on, God's going to bring it all about later on. You may be on the beginning end of the curve, but regardless of wherever you are in the process, the Lord is with you. And he's purposeful. And he's not mean, and he's not, he's not hateful. But he's purposeful. And he's loving. And he's here. So let's pray. Our Father, I pray that this morning that that we will be aware of your presence with us. Lord, just as you were faithful to Joseph, 